Good evening. Everybody good? Whew. I can just go home. All right. It's Yom Kippur, a day of atonement. <clears throat> and it started at sundown. And um, all around the world, we're honoring this day. And we're, we're moving toward tabernacles. And we'll have a tabernacle celebration on the Wednesday, the next week. Not, not this week, but the following week. Is that wrong? It's coming in quick. <laughs> my mind, the glory like falls to me. All right, here we go. October the fourth. That'll be, w and then we have a feast on the eighth here. Or if you need to sign up for that, and uh, but we're going to have our our celebration next Wednesday night on Tabernacles, and we'll teach on that as well. So we'll. Okay, I just want to release some revelation tonight. It has really to do with what John was prophesying and Heath and Stefania and uh, where we are at this moment in time. And um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get my bearings. I messed up. Lord, just come back to my mind. <laughs> uh, Lord, I just thank you for your goodness. Help Pastor Tim. Help him, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, <clears throat> I got some slides. There we go. There we go, Yom Kippur. I keep saying Kippur. That's how they say in the South. But, uh, and, and we'll talk about what this feast is about. We've taught it, we teach this every year. And a lot of people are critical of Christians who celebrate the feast and saying we're going back to tradition and all this. And, um, uh, only problem with that is the New Testament tells us through Paul in the first Corinthians five to celebrate the feast. And uh, he said, just don't do it with the old leaven and um, with leaven and malice. And, and it just really asked us to do it with the proper heart. And you will find when you study New Testament scriptures that Jesus and all the disciples, almost every one of them through the epistles, when it was feast, they were in Jerusalem. And so uh, I told somebody today, if we're going to be numbered among uh, people who are, you know, wrong for doing this, we're in good company with a lot of other people who've done it, and uh, mainly there are people in this, this, this thing called the Bible, and that's important, even on the right side of the Bible, so that's even more important for us, um, and so I want to get that. I, I have a real revelation. I really believe the Lord dropped in my heart. I came from, I was watching a, a rabbi who just did a little 10-minute thing on Yom Kippur, and it just like this thing exploded inside of me. I'm like, oh, my gosh, because they were just teaching about how it was in the Old Testament. And I just got this New Testament real, uh, revelation of it. And I just want to release that tonight. And every song we sang tonight, everything we've said so far is in line with what this feast is about and about being in the glory, being in the presence of God. And I want to just lay that out for you. So y'all ready? We're going to go as fast as we can here and, and then want to pray for you. So Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. So what comes to your mind when you think of this holiday um, or this feast day? What, what's the one thing that comes to our mind, right? Forgiveness, right? Atonement, we think about that. And so, and that's the Lord calling, don't worry about it. But uh, we, we always think about that. So when I started preparing, I thought, okay, I want to really focus on forgiveness, I just really want to, that's really, I want to just celebrate forgiveness. And, and the Lord took me on a whole nother journey. And um, so it's also called a day of awe and, uh, or the days of awe, we call it. And um, so what does it mean to be in awe? And I know when y'all look at John, you think you're in awe of him, right? Because he's just so awesome, right? But um, I know Heath is. But when we, when we, we talk about this, when we, we're in awe of something, we're just like, we have no words to describe what that is when we're in something in awe of something. And this is called a day of awe, A-W-E. Um, next slide. I, and that's what they are. I want to put one more slide here. Teshuvah is, uh, is, is the Hebrew word. And, you know, when John saw the scales, I already had this slide projector uh, made, and there's the scales. And uh, the Lord is about to shift the scales. And tonight is the start of that night. 
that we're going to move when things have been unbalanced in our life. God's about to move them over, and he's going to tip the scales in our favor. Everybody say, amen. Are we ready for that? And so uh, there's no way he could have known that was in the slides. He's not that smart. But uh, that was just a prophetic, just releasing that. So when we say, it's okay, he's my friend. He's all right. <laughs> was, right? <laughs> yeah, six love languages, sarcasm. But um, so, so it seems like, you know, when we're in awe of something or this day, you know, it's a solemn day, they say, but uh, is awe fear? Is that a question? How do we define feeling of awe? And, and why would we ever associate awe with Yom Kippur? Why would we associate it with that? And that's the journey I went on, but asking myself these questions. Next slide. And really, when I think about it, I think about forgiveness. That's what I think of. And so this is a day we achieve, according to the Scripture, this is a day we achieve forgiveness of our sin. And if this is what this day means, forgiveness, then why should it be a day of awe? That's, that's a question. Because it, it seems like awe is associated with fear and, and terror, <laughs> the terror of God. You know, I'm just in awe of him and terrorized by him. And forgiveness to me is not something to be feared. It, it, it's not. It's, it's something that is wonderful and should be celebrated. So why is then this holiday or this feast day a day of solemn awe? If forgiveness is the focus of it. And really, that's what we've always been taught. And, and, and it is. It's tied to this day. There's no doubt about it. But if you and I were writing the scripture about this feast, if we were writing it, uh, we wouldn't call this a day of awe. You know, we're better Hollywood writers than, than the Lord is anyway. We would totally focus on the news of forgiveness and how this day is a celebration of the gift of forgiveness. That's what we would do. We'd write the script that way. But this is not this is not what is said when this day is introduced in the Torah, in the in the in the book of Leviticus. Rather, it's introduced in a different way. So I want to go through the journey of how they introduce this day and kind of track about what is this feast really about? Is it really about forgiveness? Is that the main focus of this feast? Seems like it is. Okay, next slide. Here's what we say. Leviticus 16, 2 and 3. And I won't read the whole chapter. You need to, may when you go home. But it said, The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron, and he shall not enter at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark, or he will die. For I will appear in a cloud over the mercy seat. Everybody say cloud. That's why when, when, I, when I was studying this, I heard her song about the cloud, and I, I wanted to make sure that we tapped into this revelation of the cloud. And the cloud over the mercy seat, Aaron shall enter the holy place with this, with a bull of sin offering, that's for him, and a ram, a burnt offering. You know, it, it's a whole picture of what this, this feast is about. Next slide. So we see a little bit here of Aaron going in there and, and before the, the, the Ark of the Covenant. So as we track this, then we, we, we go through this. When we read this chapter in Leviticus, we go through this long, detailed procedure about how they had to properly come into this place where, where Aaron is coming in. And it... You know, we, we basically read the story as, like, if we don't do it right, then he's going to die, because the Word says that right there. And many teach this as, uh, in the, you know, us Christians, they try to teach it to us that, man, if you just miss one portion of it, you know, you're going to die. So the law, and we're under grace, so we don't need to learn anything from that anymore. And I want, to, I want you to understand something here. You know, the story goes on and on about the scapegoat, and we've taught on the goat. There's two goats, you know, and they put the sins on one, and he runs off into the, you know, sea of forgiveness, basically, and that's our sins being removed. And it also talks about seven times how he sprinkles the blood on the mercy seat, and that's all part of the, the ceremony and uh, of this whole thing. Then finally, when you read this, this uh, narrative about uh, Aaron going in there properly, uh, we finally, after a long list, we see... We see what this should happen, and that's 
The next verse, next slide here. Next verse, and this is the end of the story, basically. And it says, this shall be permanent statue for you. Everybody say permanent. So when people say the feast is supposed to end, then God must have made a mistake by saying permanent. Maybe he has a different definition of permanent, but I, for us, permanent means forever. And so God never wants us to stop celebrating this feast, all right? So in the seventh month on the tenth day, which today is, of the month, and you shall humble your souls and not do any work, whether the, the native or the alien who sojourns among you, for it shall be on this day that atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you and you will be clean from all your sins before the Lord. So, you know, that's why we focus on forgiveness, because this is the end of the story, basically. But wait, wait a minute. You know, this is at the end of the story. If we're going to tell everybody that this story is about forgiveness, and that's the focus of it, then it should be the first verse. If we're writing the script, it's the first verse, because that is what the joy of this day is about is that we're forgiven. Aren't you happy you're forgiven? I am. Because uh, i got a list of things that I'm so thankful for, and they're all my sins that he forgave me of, right? So that's a joyful thing. And so it's kind of, it's weird. Next slide. It's kind of, it's just, it's like it should be the other way around. It should be that we, we celebrate this day for our sins to be forgiven, and then we go through this process, you know, so forth. And that's not how God wrote it. So we need to see something that's hidden here. If God's going to write it this way, he has a purpose. God doesn't just do stuff just to do stuff, right? So isn't that, it seems like this is the main point. So why did God place it last? Why did he put forgiveness at the end? Especially if us who are going to walk by grace and not by the law. We just got to throw this out? Maybe there's something here for us. So it seems upside down. Don't. Come into the, you know, all this, don't come in the tabernacle this way. Come in this way, all these rules that are there. But after this long list that they would do every Yom Kippur, then we get forgiveness, it seems. Isn't that what the day is really about? So, you know, th at that time they did it once a year. So why did the Lord place it in this order? That's my question. That was my journey. What is God trying to say through this story of doing it this way. Or as the disciples would have said, had they been alive, they would have said, why do you speak to us in parables? <laughs> and why don't you just tell us plainly what you're talking about here? And that's a great question, isn't it? Why do you think Jesus did parables? You know, because it's, it's the honor of a king to search out a matter. And, and there's part of it is if he tells everybody plainly, then also judgment follows. So sometimes parables are grace because it gives you time to figure it out. And when you figure it out, you're finally ready to do it. And so maybe this day is more uh, about more than we realize. Maybe it's more than just forgiveness. What is God teaching Israel here? What if God was teaching Israel and us the ultimate plan of forgiveness? And what if he's teaching us what true atonement is? And I think he is teaching us this. So let's check out the first words of this chapter, and it'll kind of give us some clues of what God is trying to show us. Next slide. This is the first verse. It's an exciting verse. Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, and when they approached the presence of, of the Lord and died. How exciting. You know, just like, wow. Welcome to the Day of Atonement. Now I can understand maybe why it's the day of all <laughs> and terror and whatever, you know. But we know the story of, of his sons, and they brought strange fire, didn't they? Okay, they didn't bring the fire of the Lord. They brought strange fire. And tonight I felt fire up here when John was prophesying, like I was going to go back there and turn the air conditioner up because it just was fire. And so they died when? When did they die? They died when they approached the presence of the Lord. That's when they died. It wasn't so much that they didn't do everything right. It's just when they came in the presence of the Lord. They brought fire from this incense, but it was not the way the Lord instructed. So what does it mean that they died along the way or died this way? The greater question is here is where is God? Because <laughs> I need to know where he is because if I'm going to die, I need to know where he is. So dying... 
on this very day in a very day that's supposed to celebrate forgiveness. So it doesn't, say, this doesn't make sense that somebody dies on the day we're going to be forgiven. The Word says that he, it says here that he was hovering over the Ark of the Covenant. So there was a cloud over the Ark. I want you to understand this. Follow me here for a second. Next slide. And so here's, you know, Aaron's. They didn't have pictures back then, so we drew some. But these are Aaron's, you know, sons, and they, as they came into the presence, they die, right? And they're at that place. Next slide. And yet we see, like with Aaron there, it's a whole different picture because the cloud and the glory. And he didn't die. So what did Aaron do different than the, the sons didn't do? Next slide. It says here in Exodus 24, 16, The glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called to the Moses from the midst of the cloud. Next slide. So we have this awesome display of the power and the awe of God on the cloud. We see it here, right? So here's the connection. The glory and the cloud are one and the same. So when we see the glory of God and we see the glory in the New Testament, we need to just transpose that and understand it's the same thing that they were experiencing in the cloud. So we see incidents here that it happened here with Moses on Mount Sinai. We saw it in the desert, and we also see it in the Ark of the Covenant. So we see this presence of the Lord and the glory of God comes when there's a cloud. Now, I've been in the spirit realm sometimes where I get, it gets cloudy. It's just like it's hard to see. You know, in Chronicles, it says the glory came in, the cloud so, so strong that the ministers could not minister. Boy, if you got, you know, you know how powerful that glory is to shut up preachers? I mean, that's like, like some real glory that would just shut preachers up. And they couldn't say anything because the, the presence is so great. And that's what we want, right? So the, we see here, this is the mountain where the Ten Commandments are given. And so the question I want to ask you now, and you know this answer, but what's in the ark? Y'all study the Old Testament, right? What's inside the ark? The Ten Commandments, isn't it? Isn't it interesting that the cloud came, and he got the Ten Commandments, and the cloud comes on the ark, and the Ten Commandments are in there as well. So why does God hover over the ark? And I was, like, I was just praying. I said, God, what, what's the deal? What's going on there? And he says, it's Jeremiah 1. I said, Jeremiah 1? So next slide. He says, and the word of the Lord came to me saying, what do you see, Jeremiah? And he said, I see a rod of an almond tree. And the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. I was like, what? And he says, what's in the ark, Tim? And I said, a rod and the word. And I said, yes. The word of God and the rod, which says the rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So when I get in the presence of God, I'm in the word and I'm in the rod that comforts me. And so Jeremiah was in a sense, having a Yom Kippur moment. As God began to speak to him, so when God is in his presence, he's watching over it to perform it. So when we get in like we were here a while ago, and we still are, in the presence of the Lord, the Lord is in this room watching over it to see that it's performed. And he's got a rod which speaks of authority here to deal with things that are in the room. That's why we try to cultivate a spirit in meetings to cultivate the presence of God. Because nothing is withheld in the presence. And all things are possible in the presence. Well, you know, the presence is always there. Da, da, da. I, I, I understand that theologically, but there's some issues with that in us emotionally, right? And so we see this. Next slide. I mean, just a, a slide there. Just the, that's what we see in there. And now the children of Aaron, now the children of Aaron, there's two boys, try to come close to God 
And they're trying to, to re, in a sense, what they were trying to do was recreate what Moses did on Mount Sinai. And they tried to approach God in this cloud that was hovering over the ark, but they didn't do it the way God commanded them. And there are many that try that today to try to come into the presence of the Lord in a different way with strange fire. And if we serve the God of Aaron, then why wouldn't God do to those what he did to his sons? And that's what happens when we bring false worship to the Lord. Now, Aaron was told how to do it properly. Amen. Thank goodness for that. That he would bring incense in properly and he would show the pro proper approach to the cloud, to the presence of the Lord. I want you to understand that. And so the cloud that man brought through his sons, you know, was wrong. But the cloud, in a sense, that, that Aaron brought, he had incense, was, was a sense, it was a, what happened was the cloud that he was walking in, Aaron was properly, merged with the cloud of the Lord. And that's the moment of awe. Because man came in the presence of the Lord and didn't die. That's awesome. Because just, I mean, can you imagine Aaron? He just saw his two boys die, and then Moses says, you get in there now. <laughs> He's like, what? It's like, you know, Anna and Sapphira, look, they're pulling them off. The next person, are you going to give your offering? <laughs> yes, sir. I'm giving here, right? So this is the moment of all. And I want you to understand that you can have these moments all the time in the presence of the Lord. In these moments where you come before the cloud of the Lord, and because you come properly before Him, not by a work, but by grace, when you come before Him, you're going to experience Him. And it's going to be a moment of awe. That's why I tell sometimes the worship leaders that worship was awesome. It was awesome. Because why? The cloud was here. Oh, it's always here. I understand that. But there's sometimes it's here better than other times. I don't have an explanation of that. You put that in your theological oven and cook it. I don't understand that. I remember when Pensacola broke out in revival, my friend called me and said, get down here. The glory of the Lord's down there. I said, ah, the glory's in Shreveport. I don't need to go. And begged me and begged me and begged me. And I got down there and said, oh, my God, this is not in Shreveport. This is different. <laughs> And what they had done is they had began to worship and get to a place where the cloud was there in manifestation greater than it was in other places. I think it's always there, yes, but there's some places it just manifests better. And the Lord told me that we're about to enter a season. We're going to see it more and more. And we're about to go into a season where the cloud is going to be here. This is the moment of great danger when that happens, though. Because when you come into that place at that level and you don't do it properly, not that you have to follow these rules like, like Aaron had to in a sense, but you come in there and you try to get to that place in the wrong way. I had a friend of mine. Um, I don't want to uncover anybody, but this guy's a big dog around the world. And he was a former um, Satanist. But he became a believer. He was in a cult, not a Satanist. Well, same thing. But nonetheless, and he had asked her to project himself into a room of a minister friend of mine, and they saw him in the spirit. And uh, they confronted him the next morning. He says, what were you doing in the spirit in my room? And he said, oh, you saw me? And he said, yeah, we saw you. And he said, I'm sorry. I have a tendency to go back to my old ways, and I just wanted to check you guys out in the spirit. And so he went back to his old ways, you know, the, the occult ways of crossing this. That's strange fire, guys. And they confronted him and said, don't you ever do that again. And this guy is big. He's big in Louisiana. He's big in the world. You shouldn't listen to any of his teachings. If you want to ask me who he is, I'll tell you later. But because when you have like that kind of mixture, I don't want to come in the presence of God that way. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Who is he talking about? You'll find out. Okay. The point here, the point here is it's not all about forgiveness. 
It is, but it isn't. You don't do this act of worship just to get forgiveness. We don't do that. We didn't sing tonight to get forgiveness. So Aaron wasn't doing that just to get forgiveness. Hang in there. What we were seeing here between his sons and him was the same story we saw in Cain and Abel. It's the same story. Cain and Abel was another type of Yom Kippur. Cain came with the works of his hands, and Abel came with the sacrifice of the, of the, of the animal, in a sense, of the burning of the life, the shedding of blood. And God says, I don't want you coming this way, just like he didn't want the two boys. He wants you to come another way. So Aaron, in a type and shadow, came with the sacrifice of Jesus. And that's why he didn't die. And when we come to the presence of God, not on what we've done, but we come with the blood of the Lamb, we come into his presence and we don't die. What man has seen God and not died? Those who come by the blood of the Lamb. <laughs> you understand that? So do this and, you, you know, it's not do this and you'll be forgiven. It's, it's this whole thing. It was the merging of man and God it's not about what we do, but it's about what we desire. And we desire relationship. That's why we worship. That's why we call out to God. That's why we pray. We desire this. So it's the difference between the law and the grace. And so when, when, when in a sense, Aaron came in, he didn't come in on his own. He came in on the blood of a sacrifice. And when he came in, he got the experience, the cloud. And the presence of the Lord, don't you want it? I do. I want it. And I think that's what John was talking about, expectation, you know, that we need to have here. So he's the source of life. And we, what we want when worship and what we want to do in life is we want to merge our clouds and become one with him. That's what we want to do. So when you worship, that's what's happening here. So we don't want, we don't want to see a Mount Sinai experience once a year. We want to experience it every day. Jews try to experience this once a year. Tonight in Israel and Jews all around the world, they're trying to experience what happened that day, tonight. And this is it. This is one time they do it every year. But because of the blood of Jesus, Yeshua, our Messiah, we get to experience it every day. Because we're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And we get to go in every day. And as long as we go in by the blood of the Lamb, we're going to mix our cloud with His, and they're going to become one. As we experience this as a Christian, we can have this. It's called the day of awe. Every day should be an awesome day. Every day should be. I know we got trials. I've had a rough week. But I want you to know, all I have to do is mix my cloud with his, come to him by the blood, and my crises of the week, my trials of the week disappear because I'm now back in our clouds mixing together. And I'm having another awesome moment. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to grab moments, don't you? In between knotheads and problems and, you know, just issues that happen to you every single day. They're all just trying to drive you out of the presence. And Jesus didn't ever leave that place. Even though they were screaming for his life, he didn't leave that place. And we don't either. We don't have to. No longer I live, Paul says, right? The fact that, that we are so small serving this infinite God in His presence, we're consumed with it, and we look at His presence, and isn't that really what a day of awe is? Like, wow, I get to talk to God. As, as Paul tells us, in, or whoever wrote Hebrews, I think Paul did, but we, uh, we can come to the throne of grace boldly. When can you not come boldly? When you come with something other than the blood of Jesus. You better not come to the throne on what you did. 
Lord, I did this and this and this, this. I come boldly to the throne of grace. No. You come because of what he did. And you can come boldly if you come that way. I want you to follow me here. It's about to get really good. We must recognize the privilege that we have and understand this truth that all the patriarchs of old long to be in this day. And here you are mad that you're living in 2017 and how bad the world is. You ought to dream of Tahiti or some island to get away from all this stuff. How do I get out of this crisis? And the patriarchs of old looked ahead and saw the day that a people didn't hit to go into the presence once a year, but they could live in the presence every single day. And they said, we long for that day, for they saw what Messiah did to make that day happen, and we don't like the day we live in. We're stupid. That's a spirit of stupidity. Now you're complaining to all your problems. How about those guys complaining? They had to wait once a year to get that dealt with. You can get it dealt with every day, every moment. I can plug in Signs of Wonder CD and be there. I can be there that day. I want you to understand this. So what a privilege we have. What happens when we understand that what this day is really about? It comes at the end of this chapter. Next slide. We'll read the Scripture again. For it is on this day that atonement shall be made for you and cleanse you, and you will be clean from all your sins before the Lord. This is really good. The question here is this, then. If it's not our works, or as we saw in Aaron's sons, that, that forgives us or gets us cleansed, then what is it? How is the contact with the cloud and the glory of God, how does that result how does that produce a result of forgiveness? The clue is found in the word forgiveness or, or here atonement, if you want to look at it that way. We see this term at least seven times in this, in this account, and it's found in the covering of the cloud. To cleanse means this, to be pure, unadulterated, uncontaminated, morally innocent or holy, to purge and purify. That's what it means to be cleansed. Now, I want you to understand this. This scripture is telling us if you can get in the cloud, that's how you look. Awesome, Tim. That was really good. <laughs> you understand? The clouds merge over the word. And forgiveness is not really what we think it is because forgiveness is a covering. Because it says when you get in the cloud, your sins will be removed. And you'll feel like you're no longer an adulterer. You'll feel as if you've never been contaminated. You'll feel as if you're totally innocent, totally holy. You'll feel that you're totally purged of every sin. You'll feel that you're totally pure in His presence. So the cloud is a covering because what did the cloud do? It covered the mountain. What did the cloud do? It covered the ark. So when we get in the cloud, what's it do for us? It covers us. I can't see you in the cloud. If I see you in the cloud, we're like the three Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There's a fourth man in the fire. Do you understand that's what that was, a Yom Kippur moment for Daniel's, those three guys? They were in the fire, the cloud, with the fourth one, Jesus, covering and protecting them. Hmm. So, really on this day, God covers us and he merges us and God and us become one as he envelops us. That's what happens when you come with the blood. As we merge this way the cloud in his presence, that's what we're trying to do. This covering, it cleanses us, it purifies us, and we are forgiven and we're washed clean by the experience. The blood is on the ark in heaven. When Jesus died, 
and he went to heaven, he sprinkled his blood on that ark. There's an ark in heaven, you know that, because Moses copied it. He saw it in heaven first. And so when Jesus died, he went and sprinkled his blood on that ark, and the cloud covered it as well as in the heavens in the throne. And so when we worship the hymn and we go properly by the blood of the land, that's how we go to the throne, boldly. God, this is better than y'all are responding. Amen, Pastor Tim. This is really good stuff because you need to understand what's available to you and not be blinded by it. Next verse here is what Jesus says. The glory which you gave have given me, I have given to them that they may be one just as we are one. The cloud and the glory are the same. This is Yom Kippur. Jesus is dealing with it. He's saying, Lord, this is my passion, that these people be one. And when they come with my blood, Lord, make them one. And that there's no longer this guilt and the shame on them. Forgives you see, God doesn't just, forgiveness from God just doesn't come out of the blue. Woohoo, you're forgiven. He just doesn't come up with this great idea of forgiveness. God doesn't just decide to forgive. Yes, you know, you, you have to let go of your sins. That's why we repent, right? We repent, but we have the guilt, don't we? The shame and that we feel dirty. So that's why it says in Romans 8, 1, that there is therefore no condemnation to those who are Christ Jesus. Now, now follow me here. If you have shame and guilt and you feel dirty for what you've done, I'm telling you one thing. One, you're not in his presence. But if you are in his presence, it's impossible to feel guilty. It's impossible to feel shame. It's impossible to feel condemnation in his presence. How can you say that, Pastor Tim? Because the Bible says it. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in the glory. So when you feel horrible, where do you need to get? <laughs> We need to get in the presence of God because that's the covering that makes us realize when we're one with Him, we realize the revelation that we are forgiven, that we are not being held, in a sense, in bondage to what we did in the past. And if we repented of that thing, then we know in that presence we come by the blood of the Lamb, we know we are cleansed. So people who live in condemnation are people who don't thrive, thrive in the presence. They're not thriving there. They're not trying to get there. They're going, in a sense, to psychologists and psychiatrists and, you know, just trying to get this stuff off of me, get it off of me. And really all I can say, if you just get in the presence, it'll get off. In a sense, the, the covering will get, you'll be in that presence. Because I don't know about you, but in the presence of God, I've never felt guilty. Because why? I'm not focusing on me anymore. In the presence is all about Him. Now, I come, right? I come, but th that's how, how do I, so the question is, how do I feel cleansed? Yom Kippur, tells, Yom Kippur tells us that through the contact with the Lord, we feel cleansed. We enter his presence of the Lord of the cloud, not by incense anymore, but by being living sacrifices. Romans 12 says that when we, we present ourselves as living sacrifices, and what does it call it in, in Romans 12? It says it's an act of, Worship. Romans 12 is a Yom Kippur scripture. It's saying when we present ourselves as living sacrifice by the mercies of God, what's the mercy, what his blood did for us? When we present ourselves to him, we're at, it's an act of worship. We become one. And that passage says there that you'll know the perfect will of God. I, I just need to know what God's saying about my life. Get in His presence. Get in that place where you're not focusing on all your mistakes and you'll actually see where you're supposed to be going. Boom shakalaka. All right, just throw that in there. All right, that's a good word, right? 
That's off a basketball game. It's not really tongues. But I mean, somebody said that in Africa, and they actually said it means something. <clears throat> so <laughs> how, do, <laughs> how do we become clean then, all right, by his presence? To me, you know, I've always heard it a different way, but I say this, it's like through a baptism. The Hebrew word is mikvah, which is a, is a it, it, it means when they go into mikvahs in, in, in the Old Testament, they would go in these baptismal pools or these these, these pools, and, and they come out clean. They wouldn't do all their stuff until they went through that. And so what we're doing here is we're having a mikvah in the presence. We're coming into his presence, and when we do, we're being cleansed, and we're feeling pure because we're being baptized in the glory. And when we get baptized in the glory, we can't focus on our mistakes. We focus on what he did because we got there by the blood of the Lamb. And the word of our testimony is what? We're here by the blood of the Lamb. That's our testimony. When they say, how'd you get here? By the blood. There's going to be a lot of people you see in heaven, you're going to ask them, how'd you get here? And they're going to look at you and go, well, how'd you get here? Because we're all going to wonder how we all got there, and we're all going to have to say, by the blood of the Lamb. We all got there that way. Guys like Aaron's sons will not be there. I'm sorry to tell you, Hugh Hefner will not be there. I'm pretty sure. We celebrate a guy's death this week, but he came, in a sense, in false intimacy before God, and he died. Hmm. Y'all didn't like that one. Well, just that's the way it is, all right? So next verse here. (laughs) Next verse here. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Doesn't that baffle you? Why did he have to say water? Because Jesus was using Yom Kippur terminology, not technology, terminology. The covering or the cloud represents baptism. I'm being baptized in his glory. And the Feast of Yom Kippur is a cleansing cloud that we're being baptized in His presence. So every time we get in the presence, we're going through a mikvah. We're getting cleansed each time, especially when we get there because God will show us what's wrong and what, are, what we've sinned, and we just repent. And next thing you know, we're experiencing the forgiveness of Christ. So how often should we have one? Now, most of you all need a shower every day. Amen? Some of us, couple. But we, we, we need to make sure that we're ever going before the Lord. How often should I repent? As often as you need to. <laughs> so, next slide. It's this. It's like, you know, this is a baby in an embryo. But it's like when we're in him, we're in a womb. You know, we're, we're being cleansed by him as a child's born. But then... When we get in his presence, next slide, we are born again. So this baptism of his glory is where we get born again. And it's by water and by the Spirit because it's, a, it's baptism th- uh, terminology. And we've uh, we got to understand that that's how we get there. That's what the question was, you know, how, must we, how are we born again? And you know, we can't enter our mother's womb again. You know, Jesus was telling you, by, by, you're born by the Spirit and by water. And he's talking about the water of his word. Because what's the cloud over? The word. That was really good. I hope you got that. So when we wash ourselves in the water of the word, we're in the cloud. And we're washing ourselves. And that's the terminology of the bride. Because it tells the husbands to wash their wife with the water of the word. So as husbands, when we pray over our wives, we should bring a cloud. Not a cloud of dismay and discouragement, but a cloud of the glory. And we should bring it and wash our wives in the water of the word. And God did that for us. He washed us in the water of the word. So you knew in his presence you're being washed. You should come out wet. (laughs) Are you all with me? So 
the Yom Kippur is, is, is coming close to God. That's really what it means. And it's being immersed in His presence, and the cloud washes us. And what is the result of this experience is that you're forgiven. That's the result. So I, if I'm in condemnation and shame, I've got to get in His presence. If you don't get in His presence, how can you, exper- how can you experience being born again? Out of Baptist guy, he was, he he he, um, he wanted us to him and his wife wanted us to teach him about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and so we were just breaking it down, and I was doing my best, you know, Pentecostal way of doing it. And I was just going down the scriptures and lining it out. I'm about halfway through this great sermon. You know, just I'm rocking with it. And he says, stop. <laughs> I said, what? He said, the same feeling I had when I, got ba- when I got saved, I feel right now. And uh, he said, something's happening to me. And I said, well, I'm not done. I gotta finish. I gotta finish teaching here. I was really because I was getting revelation while I was teaching, and he didn't want to hear anymore because see, he got the cloud came in the room. And he didn't need to hear from man anymore. That's what First Chronicles five is. The glory came in. There was no need for a sermon. You want to quiet your pastor? Get the room full of the glory. What can I say in the glory? I'm trying to preach you into it. But if it's here, there's no need to preach. So all these long-winded pastors is because there's no glory. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. I don't know why. I don't know if that's true. I just made that up. <clears throat> all right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So... You can't experience the power of Yom Kippur until you experience the glory of the cloud of His presence. So I think it's very appropriate that His presence showed up tonight because He said, I want you to experience it. I don't want you just to know about it. All right, I asked Lindy to sing one more song and we'll go home unless the cloud don't let us. I'm ready for the day when you walk into rooms and you can't move and the glory just comes. Uh, That happened in the 90s in a lot of revivals. There were many ministers who couldn't talk. That is a miracle. The only thing greater would be if, if it happened to politicians. And um, John 17, which is, you know, y'all love John 17. I do too. John 17 is all about this feast. It's all about it. You know, Jesus is is about to um, die here. And so he's preparing them for what's about to happen. Jesus is about to go to the throne, sprinkling his blood on the, on the Ark of the Covenant. The cloud's going to go there. And then when people approach the heavens with the blood of Jesus, they're going to be one. And that's his prayer here in John 17, verse 20. It says this, I do not ask on behalf of these alone. Thank goodness this is a prayer for you and I because he was ta- praying for the disciples. Then he says, but I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who believe in me through the disciples, through their word. So when we believe the word of God and we enter into that place where we believe, we move into the cloud. Faith moves you into the cloud. And in his presence, all things are possible. Because you're no longer clouded with your stuff because you're in the spirit of being forgiven. So, you know, why don't you think you can do stuff in the Lord? Because most of the time you go, I've done this wrong, I've done this wrong. I know he won't use me that way. But in his presence, you don't have that. 
because the covering comes and you feel unadulterated. You feel pure, cleansed. And so now you think, I can do anything. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So the reason we don't do all things because we don't stay in the presence. For if I stay in that place, I would see there's nothing in me that's keeping me from doing everything he said I can do. So every time I feel inadequate, I got out of the cloud. Every time I said I can't do that, I moved away from the cloud. I get in the cloud and I get in the glory, and then I can say, yes, I can do it. That's why so many times in church services, y'all confess powerful things because the anointing's here, and you go out the door, and you go, why did I say that? I can't do that because the cloud came in the room, and you agreed with heaven for a minute. Then you got out there outside the cloud, and it didn't make any sense. That was stupid. I should have never said that. I should have never said I'll do that because you got outside the cloud. He says that they may be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Now, gosh, this is the prayer of Jesus for us, that we would be one in him. And I read this verse earlier, but the glory which you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one just as we are one. So the cloud comes, the glory comes for oneness in Christ. So Jesus has offered us the same experience that Aaron had and that Moses had, except now that was just a foretaste. If that, you know, if that was before, you know, if they had to look at him through veiled faces, how much greater, Paul says, it will be for us. So here's Moses in the presence of God, and yet he looks to 2017 and said, I'd rather live in 2017 than today. And we're just trying to do stuff Moses did. Y'all didn't like that one. Okay, let me try this. I and them and you and me, that they may be perfected in unity, that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, even as you have loved me. Now, we're talking about changing the world now. If the church would get in this cloud, this presence, we could change the world. Because we'd all finally feel forgiven and finally feel like we can do what God said we can do. So when we don't, it's all because we're so self-centered, self-focused. And we're not in the presence, so we don't feel covered and cleansed. We feel like we got to perform or do something to get out of this muck. I better do some good deeds today, feel better. That's strange fire. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory. Which you have given me and you love me before the foundation of the world. See, here this is a desire that we come into this glory, that we see the glory. I want to see Jesus. I want to see him in you. I want to see him in the earth. I want to see him in my dreams. I want to see him everywhere. And, and John provoked us tonight to good works. He provoked us to the work of entering into the rest of the Lord. Not performing, praying eight hours, doing whatever to try to make it happen. You may pray eight hours, but the, press, the, the striving must be to enter the rest of the Lord, what he did for us. And then we can enter into the glory. O oh, righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have made your name known to them, and will make it known, so that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. Wow. I just need more love Jesus in my life. No, you just need to get out of the flesh and get in the glory and realize you have all the love you need. It just can't manifest because you're not being cleansed and covered because you don't stay there. You have your moments you feel adequate, but then the inadequacy comes when you get out of that presence. So this is the year I'm prophesying we're going to stay more and more in the presence. So hopefully we stay in there 24-7. That's the goal. It's not by works. 
It's not by performing, playing the right CDs, turning the lights down just right. It's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that we enter in by the blood of the Lamb. Let's stand up. You know, and, and we say this word, we said it tonight a lot. This is the day of all. <clears throat> this is the day of all. And we, we, we understand that's, that's the first three letters of the word awesome. <laughs> and I want you to enter into this place where uh, we talk about what an awesome God we serve. And what an awesome God it is to come to His presence and get in the cloud. And I just want to repent personally for us corporately that we don't hunger enough. That's why John was being used of the Lord to provoke us to, to, to begin to long and have expectancy to be in His presence. You know what the best services we ever have or ever been in, whether here or somewhere else, it's when a group of people came with an expectancy. These guys went to a worship conference, so you have, what, 2,000, whatever, how many people were there, of worshipers, and guess what happened? The presence comes, because everybody came with a purpose to worship. And then they had to come back home. <laughs> Sunday morning, I saw this big, gnarly ball in this room it had these TV screens on it, and it was the cares of life. And everybody was just in their minds playing the story, the movie, the, the, the series of the cares of their life. And I was having a hard time getting the presence activated here because everybody was playing their movie. And so when you bring a room full of people who are focused on their cares of life, what kind of cloud's coming into that room? That's why when we come together, we lay down our stuff and we worship Him. And we say, God, we want to help this body because there's something about corporate worship that you cannot have privately. I don't understand that, but I just know it's true. It's like we're all pushing together. I think it's the principle of one puts, a, you know, a thousand, two puts 10,000 to flight. We just start driving away the demonic forces, and then we have a powerful being in the room, and that's his presence. And the cloud is here. When we get in that cloud, we experience the covering of God. We no longer feel the guilt of our shame and our sin that we've done in the past. Even though we know theologically we're forgiven, we still feel the dirtiness of it all. But in His presence, in the covering, it's gone. And so if we can live in that place, we can live without condemnation. We can live without the pain of, of our failures. And we can live in the joy of the Lord. Wash us tonight with the water of Your Word, Lord. And we declare tonight, God, you are an awesome God. And Yom Kippur today is a day of awe, and we worship you because you're awesome. <laughs> Let's sing this song together. Come on.
declare his awesomeness here tonight. He's an awesome God. We declare the day of atonement is a day of all. Pray for those in the nations tonight that maybe they're not here, but wherever they are, in the front of their computer or on their phone or wherever they are in the nations, Lord, I just declare that they will experience the cloud of His presence. We prophesy over the nations tonight that what's going to happen here in America in the glory realm will happen in those nations as well. And we declare the goodness of God knows no boundaries of miles and territories that his glory can move from one place to the next and we release the glory from Louisiana tonight to the nations we declare it Father that this is the day of Yom Kippur and this is the day that you are always awesome but this is a special day of the awesomeness of who you are that you taught us that if we get in the glory cloud that we can experience the grace and forgiveness that we can experience what it means to be covered by the blood of the Lamb. And now the Ark of the Covenant is in our hearts because we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. I want you to understand that. So inside of you is an Ark. There's a menorah. There's a communion table. There's the whole tabernacle inside of you. And in that tabernacle is the presence of the Lord. Where is it? If you ask me, it's the cloud is above your heart because the Bible says the word is written on your heart. So this cloud is inside of you. It's the word of God. So your body is a picture of Yom Kippur. And it's inside of you. And so I don't need to go somebody lay hands on me and get it. It's there. I just need to understand it's there. And I just, Lord, I pray for everybody here to experience the glory realm. We prophesy 5778 is going to be the year of glory and fire. We prophesy that you're going to baptize us in your glory this year. And we're going to be led by the cloud by day and the fire by night. Hmm. Signs and wonders and miracles will follow our life because we're going to be one with you. Lord, we repent that we live outside this realm, that we choose to live in our shame rather than live in the glory. We prophesy the glory is here. The glory is going to stay here, and it's only going to increase. We speak increase of glory in our prayer times at home as well as here. Everywhere we go, every time we talk about the Lord, the glory is coming. Every time we wash ourselves in the water of the Word, the glory is coming. Every time we recognize that He's our shepherd, the glory is coming. We have an expectation at work that the glory will show up at work. Amen. That's a miracle. Amen. Shoot. Now let me send you home tonight. We'll just sing this song as we leave, but I want you to go home with a new revelation that this day is not just about forgiveness. It is, but it's more. It's about His presence. 
and in his presence is the fullness of joy. Everything that you need is in his presence. And every obstacle is removed in his presence. That's why when Jesus looked at the storm, he was in the presence, so the storm couldn't be in the presence. When it says, peace be still. Now you understand that if you're in the cloud and you speak to a storm, it has to stop. Thank you, Lord. Father, I pray for that impartation within everybody here. Lord, we don't just want to have dreams and visions. We want the face-to-face -face encounters. We want, Lord, what Moses had and more. More and more and more. We want, Lord, where we talk to you as a friend. That's our desire. We prophesy friendship this year. We prophesy this relationship this year. It's just going to be a year of friendship and relationship. I declare that over this room and everybody here. And let's sing it one more time. Our God's an awesome God. You hug two or three people and you tell them that you know that they are awesome because God is in them as well. Thank you.